Welcome to Who Killed Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler podcast series. My name's Peter Butt. I'm a documentary filmmaker. The deaths of a brilliant scientist and the wife of his colleague beside Sydney's Lane Cove River in 1963 became one of the most baffling criminal cases of the 20th century. Well, this ranks as Australia's greatest murder mystery. As a matter of fact, I can't recall anything that I've read about happening in the whole of the world. This was a sensational crime by any standard. I mean, here you had what appeared to be apparent lovers in an adulterous relationship uh, ending up uh, semi-naked dead on the banks of a river on New Year's Day. Now, that is a terrific story under any circumstances in any country. They were convinced that I was the killer and they did everything they could to sort of prove that that was the case. Throughout this series, you'll hear exclusive interviews with police, scientific investigators, suspects, and people with sensational confessions to make. I thought it was time that I spoke up about evidence that I found when I was a child. And we'd never told anyone. My mother was too frightened to go to the police. The woman suddenly grabbed her throat and made a, a, a strangling noise. I'll also present historical and scientific evidence missed by investigators. Evidence that explains how the victims met their fate. Let's go back to New Year's morning, 1963. The location, the Lane Cove River in Sydney, Australia. Two 15-year-old boys were walking along a track alongside of the Lane Cove River for the purpose of going to a golf course and searching for golf balls. Ron Rudgley was a detective with the New South Wales CIB. And when they walked along this track, they saw what they thought was a man who had too much liquor and was lying on the grass, sobering up and they didn't take any notice of him. However, around about 10 a.m. the same morning, when they were coming back from the golf course, one of the boys noticed that the man hadn't moved at all. And I think he said that the man looked pale and his lips were purple. The boys raised the alarm at a kiosk in the nearby Lane Cove National Park. Copy. Uniformed officers followed the boys 80 metres along the track to the lifeless body. A check of his pulse revealed that he was dead. They then made a bizarre discovery. The uniformed police found that the man wasn't really clothed, but the clothes were just lying over his body in such a manner that the man could not possibly have done it himself. And there was a carpet square on top of the body, which was facing downwards, on top of his shirt, but underneath his suit coat. And that, I still feel, was a very, very unusual thing. He had no underpants on, but he had his shoes and socks on. And the toes of his shoes were also covered in mud which indicated that he may have been on the mud flats. A document in the man's wallet identified him as 38-year-old Dr Gilbert Bogle, a scientist employed by Australia's government scientific research organisation, the CSIRO. So then they contacted the detectives and the divisional detective sergeant, Sergeant Parsons, attended. The scientific investigation section, their staff attended to take photographs. The whole process of investigation was set into motion. When we arrived there at the scene, the local police had taken charge and fenced off the area. Scientific detective George Lindsay. By the time we got prepared with cameras, they'd found the second body. On the mudflats, 15 metres from the man, a constable discovered the body of a half-naked young woman, 
hidden beneath opened out beer cartons. And she was lying on her back and the lower part of her body was exposed and her bra and the tops of her dress were down around her waist. On examination by the scientific staff, it seemed to indicate that these garments had not been forced down there, had been voluntarily removed from the top part of her body with her agreement. Mud on the woman's feet and knees matched depressions on the mudflats. Her footprints were quite obvious, and twice she had stumbled, leaving knee marks in the mud as well. I had the opinion that she must have been on the verge of collapse. The scientific detectives scoured the area for a handbag or a purse, but found nothing to identify the woman. Directly below Dr Bogle's body, on the exposed riverbed, they found his belt and the woman's shoes and underpants. The bush track was a well-known lover's lane, and there was no reason to doubt that the victims had both willingly undressed. If the state of the bodies, strangely covered as they were, wasn't bizarre enough, there was something even more baffling. There were no clues as to how they met their fate. There was no sign of any violence. They had two healthy young bodies and we couldn't find any cause of their death. Right from the outset, the investigating police were absolutely puzzled as to what caused the death of these two people. You can have one person die in strange circumstances, but where you have two quite young, virile and healthy people who die virtually at the same time, and you can't tell what killed either one of them, this creates quite a substantial mystery. That morning, Detective Sergeant Parsons drove to the northern Sydney suburb of Taramara. Dr Bogle's wife was at home with her four children. I was in my bedroom, I was reading a book. Janet Bogle was 11 years old. My siblings would have been in the other bedroom except for the baby who was probably with my mother. I have a memory of two detectives knocking on the door and talking to my mother in the lounge. Parsons broke the news to Vivian Bogle. He said that it wasn't possible at this stage to determine whom or what had killed her husband. He then revealed that a woman's body was found nearby. Mrs Bogle couldn't fathom who she was, let alone what she was doing with her husband. She said that Gibb had left home at nine o'clock the previous evening to attend a New Year's party at the Chatswood home of a CSIRO colleague. After a while, she came to my bedroom door and she told me that my father had died in a car accident. I think my mother told me very soon afterwards that, that in fact, he hadn't died in a car accident, that she might have even said he'd been murdered, because that's what we probably believed at first. It was very difficult for my mother. She was extremely shocked and we were all extremely shocked too. It was not until Sergeant Parsons went to Chatswood where the New Year's Eve party had been conducted that it was suggested that the lady could be Mrs Chandler. Sergeant Parsons then arranged for the uh, detectives at Burwood to visit Mrs Chandler's home. At around one o'clock that afternoon, 32-year-old Geoffrey Chandler was dead to the world in the bedroom of his Croydon home. His two infant sons were resting in another room. Oh, how did I find out? Huh, I was asleep. I had a knock on the door from two gentlemen from the police. They said something rather bad. Do you know where your wife is? Uh, 
the detectives drove Chandler and his sons to nearby Burwood Police Station, where a female constable took charge of the children. They carted me off after that over to Chatswood Police Station and kept me there for about 13 hours, I think it was, of fairly intense sort of pressure and questioning. Geoffrey Chandler? Yes. Is your wife's name Margaret Olive Chandler? Yes. Geoffrey Chandler, the husband of Mrs Chandler, was virtually from the outset regarded as our number one suspect. This is based on police experience that when you have a death, the person's closest to them, either the husband or the wife, very often finishes up as to being the person who caused the death. We had detectives standing alongside me with their guns and their holsters brushing against my ear. These sort of intimidatory tactics. Chandler had only two and a half hours sleep in the previous 30 hours. If he had any idea about what had happened to his wife, he certainly didn't show it. Well, I think he probably took me an hour or so to wake up figuratively and literally and become aware that they were terribly serious and that something really serious and nasty had happened. Pushing Chandler for a reaction, Parsons slid a newspaper across the table. By this time, the Daily Mirror had an edition out with some great splurge on the front page. I didn't know she was dead until they plonked this on me for maximum effect. Quite sort of cold-bloodedly to gauge my reaction, I guess. As he read of the deaths, he showed no reaction whatsoever. He simply removed a cigarette from a pack in his shirt pocket and lit it. He gave every indication of being completely blasé about his wife's death. He gave no indication that he was upset. It was quite clear that their first and foremost thought was that I was responsible for Margaret's death. Parsons asked Chandler how his wife knew Dr Bogle. He said that he and Gib Bogle had been colleagues at the CSIRO for several years, but Margaret had first met him only 10 days earlier at a Christmas party. Before Christmas, the CSIRO had a staff Christmas party at the Murraybank Radio Astronomy Station. Gib was there. She was attracted and flattered by his attentions. Don't forget, she was also a fairly innocent young lady, and I certainly was not sophisticated and worldly wise in the way that Gib was, for example. I mean, Gib had been overseas, and she was flattered by his attentions, and he was attracted to her because she was a very pretty and lovely lady. It was established that this was the first occasion that he'd ever met Mrs Chandler. She appeared to be attracted to him and he to her. He had disappeared with Mrs Chandler and they were seen coming out of the shadows of the bushes actually by Mrs Chandler's husband. The only time Mrs Chandler would meet Dr Bogle again was six and a half hours before they died. I think the reason why we got the invitation to go to the Nash's party was because of Gibbs' attraction to Margaret, or his desire to see her again. On New Year's Eve, the Chandlers left their two children with Margaret's parents. They arrived at the home of Ken and Ruth Nash at 10.30pm. It was a sedate affair with 20 invitation-only guests, the women in fashionable dresses and the men in suits and ties. In shirt sleeves and sandals, Geoffrey Chandler immediately felt out of place. The Penn Nash New Year's Eve party was pretentious, effete. I didn't know many of them. I think of the ones that were there, I think I only knew Ken Nash and Gibb, really. Looking glamorous in a white lame gown, Ruth Nash pinned a name tag onto Margaret's rose pattern dress. Gibb Bogle came over to assist 
Margaret was overheard asking Gibb if his wife was present. He said she was at home tending to a sick baby. The Nashes told the police that Gibb and Margaret spent a good deal of the evening together. As for Geoffrey Chandler, he left the party not long after his arrival. About 11.30, Geoffrey Chandler said that he was leaving to buy some cigarettes. Of course, this wasn't true because he left the party and drove straight to an address at Balmain where there was another much larger New Year's Eve party in progress. Where he had previously arranged to meet his girlfriend, Pam Logan. Well, it was a big party. There were over a hundred people there. there. I have a fair recollection of seeing Jeff there around midnight. The Balmain party host, Ken Buckley, was a lecturer in economic history at the University of Sydney. I got to know him through a mutual friend at Sydney University. John was working in CSIRO, which was located on the the Sydney University campus. I knew he had this girlfriend, and I liked her. She was a very nice person who was a secretary in the university. She and Jeff were both at my party, But uh, other than sort of greeting them as one does as a host when you see them, I I didn't really have anything to do with them that night. The detectives were astonished by Chandler's double life, his wife at one party and his girlfriend Pam Logan at another. Parsons suspected that Chandler's affair with Pam Logan was behind the death of his wife and Dr Bogle, and to prove it, he set out to establish his whereabouts throughout the night. He remained with Pam Logan at Balmain for about two hours. They then spent half an hour or a little more at her home. He then got back into his vehicle and returned to the party at Chatswood where he'd left his wife. He turned up there around about ten minutes to three, just as they were serving supper. And he then remained at the party with her until shortly after 4am when Chandler left. And it's quite clear that Mrs Chandler left with Dr Bogle in his car. If that arrangement wasn't strange enough, Chandler offered up another sensational revelation. Geoffrey Chandler informed us that prior to them leaving the party, He had asked his wife whether or not she wanted to have intercourse with Dr Bogle and as she agreed that this would be acceptable to her, he then asked Dr Bogle whether he would see his wife home, to which Dr Bogle agreed. Geoffrey Chandler claimed that he left the Nash party at about 4am and drove across the Harbour Bridge, returning to the home of his girlfriend Pam Logan. They then went to Margaret's parents' home to pick up the children. Detective Parsons was astonished. The interview with Geoffrey Chandler was interrupted and arrangements were made for the lady in question, Pam Logan, who resided at Darlington, to be interviewed before Mr Chandler could contact her. The 21-year-old was taken aback at the sight of police officers at her door. Without divulging anything about the deaths, they asked her to verify the information supplied by Geoffrey Chandler. The information and statement obtained from Miss Logan completely substantiated what Geoffrey Chandler was claiming. Logan said that Geoffrey Chandler returned to her home at 4.30am, precisely when Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler would have arrived at the Lane Cove River. She agreed to go with him to Granville for the collection of the children Now this is completely established. We have three independent persons having seen him and his girlfriend and also the children in his car travelling to and from Granville along Parramatta Road. This is without question because Chandler's vehicle was one which no one could possibly miss. It was a very long 1925 model Silver Vauxhall Tourer. 
And uh, at this particular time, he was doing exactly as he claimed he was doing. This was around the time that Bogle and Mrs Chandler were down on the banks of the river and met their fate. I had no idea how she finished up down there. I knew that he was going to take her home, bring her home to my place in Croydon, but it never occurred to me that to wonder why she wasn't there. I don't know, it's all very confusing still. The interrogation continued until two in the morning. I was in a state of shock. I was in a very invidious position. It was an object of suspicion. I mean, it's natural on their part. The husband is always the prime suspect. Chandler's alibi appeared sound, but he was not off the hook. There were other ways to kill without being present with the victims. The following day, Chandler came face to face with the reality of what had occurred. I was summoned down to the old morgue to identify Margaret's body. It was all staged for maximum effect. None of this discreet little business of and they pull back the the sheet to expose the face. Here was Margaret stretched out fully naked on a block of marble and that was the way she was presented to me. I had detectives all arraign themselves to watch my every little action to see whether I was going to break down, whether I was going to confess. When he viewed the body, he just looked at it and said, oh, you know, she's a bit dishevelled, isn't she? She didn't have that mark on her nose. He certainly didn't show any emotion or great upset. You see, Geoffrey Chandler was our logical suspect. He was the media's logical suspect. He was the public's logical suspect. The story of the mystery deaths led radio and television news bulletins across the country. This was a sensational crime by any standard. Gerald Stone was a feature writer for the Daily Mirror. Here you had uh, what appeared to be apparent lovers in an adulterous relationship uh, ending up uh, semi-naked dead on the banks of a river on New Year's Day. Now, that is a terrific story under any circumstances in any country. I don't know how much my younger siblings absorbed, but I was the oldest one at 11, and my next sister down was nine. Dr Bogle's daughter, Janet. I think we were relatively capable of comprehending things, especially me probably being older. I mean, I don't think we were reading the newspapers, but we seemed to be getting wind of what the newspapers were saying. But we heard pretty quickly that he'd died with this woman on the river bank at Lane Cove. And we were all extremely bewildered. I got quite a shock. It was the day following New Year's Day, I think. It was a very hot day and I decided to take a break. I turned on the television and uh, her face came on the screen and I couldn't believe it. And my husband came in and he said, that's Margaret Chandler, what's happened? And I said, well, I can't really know. Her body was found with some man or near some man. To Margaret Chandler's friends and acquaintances, like Sheridan Pawsey, the death of the 28-year-old former nurse was beyond comprehension. I was very upset about it. Because, you know, frankly, I liked her. She was a likeable woman. And she had been a nurse. She was a very pleasant, normal, pretty. You know, the nice, healthy look that most nurses have. She had that. And what I call wholesome. Mrs Pawsey had known the Chandlers for four years and believed she had the measure of Geoffrey. He was a tall man. He had this beard. 
And I think that this was the attraction to the newspapers. They didn't often get a young man with a beard. He was always extremely polite to me, but he had a very soft voice, a well-spoken voice. He spoke towards Margaret and the children and the dogs in, in a gentle manner. He was far too, as I say, gentle, and I couldn't see him as a murderer, no way. I think I heard it on the radio in the morning that they died. Marine scientist Claire Rudkin was also a friend of the Chandlers. I knew Jeff and Margaret Chandler. They were friends. We used to have parties at their place. Jeff was in the Labour Club with me. I think he came across as cold to some people, but I saw him as a very reserved person, but not cold. I used to think he was quite cute, actually. <laughs> Margaret was also very quiet. But she had a lot of strength of character. And when we had parties at their place, she'd say, when it's time to go to bed, she'd say, right, she says, I'm going to bed. I want you all to go home. And she did so nicely. Everybody respected her and people would go home. They seemed to be happily married, but they had an open marriage. Well, it was very unusual. It was free love. And they believed that you could be able to sleep with anybody you wanted to, and it wouldn't disturb your more close relationships. The cops couldn't accept the idea of any person, Chandler or anybody else, being reasonably agreeable to their wife going off with somebody else and still remaining uh, part of the married couple. The coppers just couldn't conceive of this. They expected somebody in that situation to be extremely generous and possibly to resort to violence. That's why they suspected it was Chandler. But they had really nothing to go on. I really wouldn't see Margaret being terribly open with her favours. Who knows? She might have been dressed up in her, her best. She might have had a few drinks. Could have been a particularly charming man that charmed the birds off the trees. I don't know. Perhaps this was the one time she did fall. I mean, even so, sex doesn't kill you. Coming up in episode two of Who Killed Dr Bogle and Mrs Chandler. They weren't choked, they weren't shot. <laughs> it was quite obvious that it could only be one thing. Put it this way, something entered those two bodies. About two or three days later, I got a bit of shock because I got two detectives at the door. Yes, I had given her some pills. This had all the elements that any journalist could ever wish for. And the main part of it was not only these facts, shocking facts, but it allowed for the imagination to run wild as to how that happened. Who Killed Dr. Bogle and Mrs. Chandler podcast series is produced by Black Bottle Films with the assistance of the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia.